This is a session on, I want to say, fundamentals of Git, on getting acquainted with some of the more interesting niggly bits of Git. Um, it's also what I'm going to refer to here forward as um, Lori's guaranteed recipe to set a speaker up for failure. Some of the things I've been hearing she's been saying, they're just, it's not true. Um, but anyways, I'm going to do my best here, and I'd like you guys to like, come and learn along with me. So, uh, my name is James Chambers. This is like my logo slide. Ooh. I'm a member of the Western Devs. We're a group of really diverse uh, developers. Um, it's not uh, uh, Western Devs and Monsters. We're, we're not like for-profit stuff. We just do community things. We post. We have podcasts, we share the stuff that we're learning as we learn it, and we put it out there in the community for the community to consume. Um, so Western Devs, the thing I love about being a part of that organization is, or that uh, group of people is that there's everything from um, Linux people to uh, MS SQL people to analytics people to LAMP stack to PHP to TFS and uh, ASP.NET and everything in between. Lots of really great stuff in there, uh, F Sharp. People who specialize in testing, it's great, and there's just a lot of really cool content coming out of out of Western Devs. Um, so, uh, I'm the green guy in the middle in there. Um, uh, Simon, Dave, and I started up ASP.NET Monsters. It's a show on Channel 9. You can check that out. I've got links for it later. And I work at a company called Clear Measure, which is based out of Austin, Texas. I actually remote work, so I work from my home in my basement in Brandon, Manitoba. So I really appreciate you guys having me out here. Um, if you know me, you know that I'm passionate about tech, but I'm also passionate about a few other things. Um, my high school sweetheart, we met when we were 15, we got married a few years later. We uh, immediately started forking the repository and creating <laughs> multiple iterations along the way. Um, and uh, we'll support those for at least 18 years, we've got a long expected life cycle. Um, and I'm also uh, passionate about a few other things. Uh, my oldest son was diagnosed with juvenile diabetes when he was four years old. Um, that's basically that equates to having 4,000 needles a year just for him to stay alive. So there's, uh, in the first world countries we can make it work, it's not too much money, but in third world countries, um, that's about three weeks salary um, every week that you would need to keep your child alive. So it's a death sentence for kids overseas. Uh, so that's something, uh, clean drinking water, access to clean drinking water and child poverty. Um, I live in a town, Brandon, Manitoba, as I already said, 40,000 people there. Um, these bottom two claim the lives of 40,000 kids every night, every day of the year. So um, definitely something that I'm, I'm not just a geek, so if you want to talk to me about some other stuff, we can jam on that. I'm also a race car driver, um, but as I, as just like what happens when I get into uh, multi-threaded code, sometimes I get into a race condition that's not very uh, <laughs> desirable. So that's before the car landed. There was quite a um, cloud of smoke after that. Uh, so that was interesting. Okay, um, take some quick inventory here. Um, who is, I just need to, Get some more size here. Who's currently using source control? You guys are all using, okay, this is awesome. Uh, who's using Git? Most of you guys are using Git. Who says they're like super confident in Git, Git and they, they really know what they're doing and they don't have any trouble with questions? Because um. you can, well then come up here if you want. They just, <laughs> you can do the rest, I have the slides already, you're good. Um, who commits source code, if you're using Git then, who's committing source code more than once a week? More than once a day? Fewer hands, more than once an hour. Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, when that's kind of the, the cadence, like you'll find that when you move over to Git, because branches are cheap and, and commits are easy, you're going to find that there's your your actually your cadence in that in, in getting your code committed is going to be a lot quicker as you start to get a feel for it. Um, who's doing? And this is kind of a tangent, but who's doing automated builds uh, tied off of merges and things like that? Awesome. How about automated deployments? Cool. And um, who checks in their binary dependencies? So you've got your source control repository, you take a dependency on a third party library and you check that DLL in. Who does that? that of you? you guys all use NuGet? Something like that? Okay, that's fine. Just like to kind of understand better. Um, my, uh, there's this thing called team memory. And a really good example of it, I, I asked my wife in, just before Christmas, I was like, What's that song with that movie where the girl walks outside from the church? And she's like, Bittersweet Symphony. Do you guys remember the movie Cruel Intentions? It's from the 90s. We'd watched it together as teenagers, and just by making that one reference, she knew exactly what I was talking about. Now, if I said that to anybody else, and maybe even if I gave you this picture, you might not even really be able to put those two things together, but that's kind of what happens when we work on a team for a long time. 
And one of the things that source control does for us, and I'll, I'll move quickly through this because you guys seem sold on it, but the, it really captures um, the business intelligence that we have lost along the way, and it lets us go back and kind of relive some of those earlier memories of the project. Um, but we're mostly more interested in the delta. We're mostly interested in the change, and not the entire set of files. And it's, we can, especially um, if you think about that in the context of like this crazy, huge, large project that you've worked on, and there's hundreds of you know hundreds of files across dozens of projects. There's a lot of stuff going on there. There's a lot of movement going on. And if you had to figure out from that check-in to the next check-in, what was different between all of those things on your own, that would actually be a really monumental task. So what we want our source control to do is to be very effective at telling us what the delta is between what it was previously and what it is after a point in time. Okay, so centralized source control, who has used things like TFS, source safe, it's okay, you can admit it. <laughs> we'll do a support group afterwards. Okay, there's other ones. See the, or, uh, for the, the centralized stuff, there's some other ones um, uh, that you can use as well. But the, the premise is basically that we've got um, a, a source of truth that's the centralized server, right? And um, that at that uh, level, we have to kind of indicate our atten intent to make modifications if we want to do it the right way, if we want to kind of follow the paradigm, we have to mark, express our intent by actually checking a file out and saying, I'm going to be working on this. And that can cause some interference for us. That's one of the problems. Commits happen directly against the server, and updates happen from the server. So in a centralized model, whenever we need to sync up changes, we're talking directly to the server. There's no real other practical way to do that. In a distributed source control mechanism, we've got something else going on. Because that repository lives wherever the code, it follows the code, it moves with the code. And that empowers us to make changes um, locally because we got the source of truth with us all the time. And that is um, expressed uh, usually by some kind of um, hashed rec uh, recognizable component that our system understands, that our upstream understands. We can create remote branches to express intent and we can share those with people that we want to collaborate with. And we can, our, it's the local graph of changes where we actually make our commits, not at the server. And when we make commits locally, the server doesn't know about them until we actually push them out. And we can push and pull to the remote repository rather than doing this update cadence where we're resolving conflicts and things like that. We're doing pushes and pulls to do our synchronizations um, and or pull requests which um, are, if you think about it, are just like this with a checkpoint in it. There's a bit of a gate there. And so one of the things that really broke down for me was when I, under, uh, I saw this for the first time, this, or when this picture started to come into my head. Because what happens when you've got distributed source control is yeah, you can do pulls and pushes with the, what we might think of as the, the core repository, the central repository, but we can also do that against other clients. And then I was kind of like, what? <laughs> Because I was like, that's crazy. Um, this is a quote. Uh, yes, let us use distributed technologies. That way we can trade our problems for distributed problems. By a really famous person. Is there. Um, that's not really an, inter an advocate, but it's okay. <laughs> there are some things that we need to consider, though, um, as far as the benefits and challenges when we're considering. Like, there's, it's not just like we're, we are trading problems. There's a new set of things that are introduced. We have decided, as a community at large, as developers, we've kind of said, yeah, this is a better way of doing it, but we do have, like, there's, there's good things. We have faster workflows, and we get to pick what those workflows actually look like. You don't have to, there's not a set of tooling that dictates how we're going to go about our normal workflow, um, which is the case with some centralized service. On the other hand, it's hard to enforce policy. So if some guy wants to come up with his own thing, there, there are gates that we can put in place, but if somebody wants to come up with their own thing, they're free to do that. And locally, because they've also got the source of truth, they can do whatever they want to do locally. Um, I, I think that one of the, the coolest arguments is that there is a, uh, this opportunity for us to explore the code base without worrying about any kind of impact that we're going to have on our peers. And so experimentation takes on a life of its own. And I think it really empowers developers who are confident using the tools to start to experiment a little bit. However, we also have a loss of visibility. Um, previously, when I was working in the TFS world, we actually had a repository called Spike. 
And whenever anybody was doing something as a side project, trying to figure something out or hack on some new bit of the system, they would go over, create a spike project and check that in. And that was really healthy because we could actually monitor that repository and see what other people were doing. And maybe down the road we can say, oh yeah, I think somebody was parsing CSV and converting to JSON so I can go grab that code that they've run in that spike project. And we don't get that if people aren't adhering to that, those same principles in a distributed system, if they were just spiking locally, then we may never see those. It's, it's a risk, it's not the only thing that can happen. There's other brighter alternatives. Uh, branching's lighter, we're not making entire source code, we're not, not making entire clones of the source code. And although the distributed aspects can vary from system to system, the really cool thing about Git is that there is a, a much lighter branching mechanism. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, on the other hand, you can run into things, like one of the first things that I did when I came onto the project that I'm currently working on was I kind of went in and had a look and we had like 118 branches that were all at various levels of synchronicity on, on GitHub. And it was like, um, okay, so how much of this actually holds important information? And because anybody was able to create branches, um, everyone, everyone could. There's also this freedom for private integrations. So I can fork a repository and then start then I kind of own that fork. I can actually take that source code out and start doing whatever I want to do against it on, on uh, a source control server. And so I can start integrating with other services in whatever way that I want to. The, the problem that becomes though is that if we've got desired integrations, like if we want certain things to happen as people are making certain types of changes or modifications to the project, for example, triggering builds or running tests, we lose that ability. Um, in a distributed model because anybody can own the code. We can work wherever, where is required uh, for the task at hand rather than having to check files out and express intent that way, which is really powerful, but of course, on the flip side of it, it means that you can have seven or eight people working on the same thing at the same time. So um, part of the lab afterwards, we're gonna kind of open it up. I have a repository that I'll share with you guys, and we can try and like, totally mess it up and then we'll just work together and try and fix it too. So we'll come up with something there that we can do that's kind of fun. Um, anybody can create things, labels, little tags, uh, branches, new repositories if you've got an organization, they've got permissions set up. And that's kind of more the default stance. You have to do a little bit of configuration in order to make that not true in the Git world. Um, that, that's also the problem. Although, so anyone can create and then that's kind of the problem is that anybody can create. Like even that guy on your team. You know that guy I'm talking about? He can do creating things. No, it's not good. Okay. So, uh, Git, as opposed to things like SVN or Mercurial, why, why, uh, why Git? And I actually, this isn't, uh, I would actually say uh, Git is an expression or a flavor of this kind of uh, system, but a lot of similarities between some of these other um, pieces that are out there. But compared to SVN, very cheap branches. Um, all that is, all that changes on your system when you create a branch is there's a pointer added to the database that points at this name, and that name can move along with your code. Okay, so a branch is nothing more than a, a point in time that moves along with commits, and it's pointing at the latest commit under that name. Um, it's very similar to tags, except when you add a tag, the difference between a tag and a branch is that the tag stays in place. It doesn't move along as you make additional commits. But inside the database internally in Git, it's basically the same thing. One moves, the other one doesn't. Um, there's a really good diff engine. So if you, um, once your projects have been running, the initial commit's always big, right? There's a lot of stuff that goes in. If you do file new project in MVC, there's like 473 files that get created or something like that. Um, so your first commit's gonna be big, but after that, the difference in size between what your repository was and what your repository becomes after you do a commit is very, very, very small. Um, so it's, it is, it's got a really good diff engine uh, built in. There's a lot of uh, really cool things out there for visualizing how your work operates. If you don't like the command line, then there are really powerful um, GUI tools that you can use. Um, I actually use a mix. So from a command line, I use what's called Posh Git. Do you guys use the GitHub for Windows client? Does anybody? A couple? I highly recommend it. Um, it is, from its infancy, it has grown so much. There's, a, there's just a lot of power in it. And for a lot of the things that are a little bit more difficult to do, for example, um, not even really difficult, but the things that are, yeah, difficult to do from the command line anyways, it makes light work of inside the client. So the um, uh, GitHub desktop 
Part of me is cross-platform, so you can run it on Linux, Mac, or PC. Um, it works great, and it really solves a lot of problems. But there's others, external pieces to the tool chain uh, beyond uh, what GitHub or the Git community provides, and that's uh, expressed through things like AppVare or um, other integrated uh, uh, tools that you can use to integrate with your code base and uh, queue off of things. There's the Git status API, which we use on our project. So as an example, um, when somebody checks in or does a pull request, when they create a pull request, we're watching the whack refs whack pull star, and anytime that a pull request is created on GitHub, our build server automatically cuts a new copy or uh, creates a branch locally, merges back to our develop branch, builds that code and runs the ex and executes the tests, and we know, and then we get a status notification back to our repository on GitHub telling us whether or not we won't even proceed with a uh, pull request until we know it's passing because we want your tests passing before we do the review. So there's some really great things that you can do. A couple of tenants of Git. Um, there actually, we, uh, I was just recently at a conference and there was this uh, great uh, presentation that was done in like five minutes talking about the Git graph proper um, by one of the developers there. Uh, she did a lightning talk. Um, and it was a really great way to dive in and understand how the graph works. So um, in any graph, we've got nodes and edges. And in a directed graph, the edges indicate which way the nodes are traversing, which way you traverse the, the graph in order to get to the node. Um, that you're, or where the node is coming from, if you want to think about it from the other way as we do commits in Git. But it's also an acyclic graph, which means that you can go from any node elsewhere on the tree, but traversing the directed edges, you cannot get back to the same node. So because it's a differencing engine, it's just the, that's just the, how, it, how it becomes. But um, if you understand graph theory, this was actually one of the things that earlier on kind of started lighting things up for me, was that, okay, we've got nodes and edges and they're directed. This makes a lot, a lot more sense. Um, it's, this is one of the things that I think is very true about uh, Git. It's powerful and terrific and complicated, but rather than wasting our time, I'll just say it's powerificated. <laughs> um, which is very true of Git. And I find that there's, for anybody coming from a different non-distributed source control mechanism, I find that this is, there seems to be this like really steep learning curve and then you're like, and then you're good. And it's, it's fine after that. Um, on the plus side, um, I do believe that for most of what you are going to be doing, 90% of it, the basics are really easy to pick up. There's some great tools that cover the other 6% and then beyond that we've got Stack Overflow, so we're probably good. So some of the basics that we've got. We want to get started. What are the things that are important to know? Well, one of the uh, really cool things that I found, one of, the, one of the basic things that kind of like blew my mind was I can go to a command line in any directory, just type git init, and I've got source control. And I'm like, what? <laughs> like, it's pretty cool. Like, I mean, there's like, the, the, I don't know if, if anybody was using like TFS back in like 2005, 2006, there was this like 45 minutes project spin up time to get a project up and going and you're selecting templates and applying policies and everything. It was like crazy, it was madness. And like now I can just drop to a command line, get in it and I'm good to go. Um, I want to, as I make changes, I need to add the changes that I've made. So I use git add and then I can add a specific file, anything in the directory that's um, you know, been changed or I can add um, any, or anything in the repository that's been changed or I can add very specific files or folders. It's, because it's from a command line, it supports filtering as you would um, doing like directory searches and things like that. And then I, need, I just need to make a commit and then that is what moves me along. That's where the difference is created. So um, as I start my repository and I make commits, this is that acyclic graph that's growing. And because I, without doing anything like changing branches or creating branches, I end up with master, in this case, um, as being on the latest commit that I've made. What's really cool is I can kind of move backwards through those nodes, right? So that's one of the, um, one of the things. So uh, we're gonna look at uh, building this out here uh, tonight. Uh, this is actually um, uh, part of a series of puzzles that we're gonna be working through in the workshop portion after the break here. So, uh, right, basics, we're knitting, we're adding, we're committing. And if we were working locally, that's pretty much all we would need to do to kind of work on our own and have source, source, source control where we can track the differences. Um, 
if we want to, and again, as I said before, uh, at each one of these uh, commits that I make, this, the delta in size is the same, it's the same, it's only the size of the difference. It's not a complete copy of those files. So the database doesn't grow that quickly. If we're leveling up and we understand those things, then we want to move on uh, quickly and learn some other um, aspects of it. So uh, one of them is git amend. I've made, um, I forgot something and I need to add it to my last commit. Um, typically we're changing messages, those kinds of things. We've got git log, which if we just type git log from the command line, we see the history of all of the steps that have taken place, all of the commits, um, as my branch is aware of. Now remember that if I'm down here, then I might know of this path, whereas I, and after I merge, I would also be aware of that path and have that commit as well. But I'm only going to know the commits that have been merged into my, into my uh, branch. So um, git log will give us that information. We've got git ref log, so we can go back and change history. That's um, probably not going to do that today. Um, we've got branching and checkout. So I, I create a branch called bug fix. I can check out master and add commits to it and move along. And then um, I can, as I create a new branch, I can actually just check out a new branch, pass it some flags. So there's some syntactic sugar that we can learn as we go as well. Um, those are kind of the, this is kind of the, I, I feel like this is, these are the commands you need. There's five here and three on the previous one. Once you get those under your belt, you're actually humming along pretty good in Git. It's not much more complicated than that for 90% of the time. And then there's going to be other stuff that happens. So we're eventually going to need to do some merging. And at first it's pretty simple. Um, merging, if you're just doing branches on your own and merging things in and you're not working with other developers, it can actually be pretty straightforward. So I, if I've created a branch called bug fix, I go over to that, I make some changes, I add some commits, I write my tests, um, or I would write my tests first because I'm you know, doing test driven development. Um, I write my tests, I write some code, I, I uh, do my commits, and then I'm going to merge it back to master. So I would check out master, and now I'm on the master branch, and I can merge those changes in. Now the really cool thing is if I get, if I create a branch, and I'm working on a particular bug that is medium priority, and a high priority bug comes in, I just simply pop back on a master, I check out master, and then I create a new branch, I start making commits over there, and I merge those back into master, and then I'm done. I can check out my other branch again, and away we go. Uh, when it gets, oh, well, this is supposed to be more advanced merging, so things start to get a little bit um, crazier uh, when you get more people working on your project, and then merging becomes a bit more of a challenge. And what happens is, um, on that medium priority uh, bug fix that I was working on, I had some changes that I was making to a particular aspect of the system, but there was a more critical bug that came in and customers weren't able to check out. So I've gone over and I ended up having to work on that same module, and I've made changes that are in conflict over there or that need to be also available in this other branch. And I merge those into master. And when I finish my bug fix over here, I don't want those changes to disappear. But I also don't want to make it look like it's my own work. So we want to be truthful about how, what the history of, of um, our repository is. And because remember, everyone has a truth, right? We're all uh, a, a source of truth. So we want to maintain that source of truth. And rather than saying those changes are also my changes and making them again in mine and merging those over from that other higher priority uh, branch, I'm going to take those changes because they were merged into master. I'm going to rebase uh, my uh, branch off of master. So to illustrate that, I've got a repository. We make some commits. We move part way down, and this is our master branch. And then I work on my medium priority uh, defect over here. Sorry. And I add some commits. And then somebody tells me, hang on a second. We have this higher priority one. So we come over and we start working on the higher priority one. I check out master. And then I create a new branch for the high priority fix. And I add a couple of commits. And then I merge them. What happens when I merge them is that these commits come over here onto master. Okay? That's, we understand how that works. Now this branch, I can actually delete it. it it's, the history that it was there will remain inside of the repository, but I, I no longer need it. Now I've got these critical things that need to be on my branch here before I move them over. I can't release them. So what has to happen is this concept called a rebase. Who is rebasing their code? 
Just a couple. Awesome. We're going to do rebasing today, guys. This is going to be so much fun. So what happens when we rebase is we say, okay, I have those two commits, but first I need these commits to come over here, and I'm going to make sure they work on mine. So I rewind my changes back to where master was, and I replay these commits. It, it applies the change sets in the repository for those diffs that were created. It applies those to the repository, and then it replays my commits over top at the tail end of it. And it's really important because if um, you are working with, maybe you're working with database migrations, maybe you're working with um, uh, form validation and, and things like that, and those need to be represented. Now when I do the pull request back here, when I merge back over, all that comes are the commits that I had in, in my branch. And then this branch can go away as well. And that is what, in a nutshell, the idea of continuous integration looks like, where we're actually constantly updating our source code <coughs> based on what's in, in master. So that's a very important uh, piece. There's also actually people who argue that that's not enough, that we need to be um, merging our stuff with everybody else on the team as often as possible, which is kind of like a next level thing. Yeah. So rebase, so one of the things I, I'm starting to kind of think about is the change history. So you have those the story of the two fixes that you did that were kind of independent of each other. Yes. So with rebasing, it's, it's kind of keeping that history of that change and putting it back into the master. And then one of the things you want to do is you want to maintain that, that change history. Well, imagine what would happen if we had a set of changes over here and then we took all of the changes that were here instead um, and we just merged them over. We would end up with a merge commit down here that looks like I changed 60 files, right? And that's not truth in, in terms of how the repository played out. So I don't want this. I don't want to replay these changes at the end of where I am in the graph. I want my gra graph to reflect, I'm coming in on the tail end of wherever master is. So I need this, these changes not to be reflected as one, but however many there are up here so that when I merge back, I have those commits in the graph. So this is, this is something you have to think about when you're doing these, that rebasing. Is that, um, or am I misunderstanding? Well, I don't think about it. When I'm doing a rebase, I just, like I, I know that whoever has code in master, they win. So their changes get to go in first, and I need to adapt my code on top of that. Right. So what we're always trying to do, that's why I was asking about how often people are making commits, because if I'm committing multiple times an hour, if I'm doing, if I'm pulling from master, whenever I see, you know, we've got a Slack channel open and we see pull requests being merged, as soon as I see that, I pull a copy of master and I rebase. There's no point in me working off of a weird state that is not valid, right? The minute that somebody else adds commits on master, my branch is not valid. It's, it's irrelevant and I need to update it based on what's in master. Because there's going to be additional tests there. There's going to be additional functionality. There's going to be a bug fix. I need to be able to control that and make sure that I'm reflecting that in my code base. Yes? Yeah, just another quick question. Then. If it is the same feature that you're working on, as you were saying, and you rebase, it's going to break your code. Is that right? Um, it can. Um, it break your code in what way? Like, I mean, if, you, if, we, if somebody else on the team, or even if you had another branch where you were competing, you had competing interests, mm -hmm. in the and you came in, you're going to end up with a conflict, and you'll need to reserve that, mm -hmm. um, which is actually what we're talking about next. So yeah, that's, we, why, that's why I asked yeah. the question. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it was a great <laughs> segue. Thanks. That's why I did that. I was going to say, yeah, total <laughs> plant, total plant. <laughs> um, yes? With, it might be a little confusing the way that you redrew your diagram. Okay. Um, master, so those two greens were going down, straight down from master. Sure, yes. And you got to think that every branch is, um, it has a root, right? Where your branching point was. And that was that second red one at the top, that yeah. one, right? Yeah. And rebasing is changing your root of your branch. Absolutely. And it's replaying your changes off of that new um, base 
for your brain. Absolutely. And therefore, then, I, there's another thing that you'll start to look at, too, when we start talking about, like, the sha or the hash that gets created for your commit. When you do a rebase, you actually, all of your commits, like, the identifier for those commits change. Um, it's something you probably don't have to worry about most of the time, but it is a reflection of that, that history has changed. And in, in that, you've got a different base, a different starting point um, for your, where your, your branch starts. Okay? So then we run into a little bit of problem and we get a conflict going on. And the worst time that I feel that this can happen is in uh, a rebase, especially if you've got a branch that has grown um, too long. Like if, it's, if a branch has lasted, we try and break our work down into stuff that can be done in four hours. That's kind of, we don't want to get any more granular than that. Most of the time, you know, things are within the eight hours. And that helps us control uh, merge conflicts and problems through rebasing, but for the most part, we, we still run into merge conflicts almost every time, uh, simply by virtue of when you've got a team, there's nine people on our team, which is, I know, more than what the Agilistas will tell us to use or whatever, but the, um, the reality is that we've got nine people, so there's multiple pull requests going in a day. Um, and effectively, if four or five hit the wire within half an hour, nobody's had a chance to do a pull request review, then we're going to get conflicts. We're going to start trumping each other's code. So we're going to end up in a situation where we need to um, do something more interesting. So let's have a look at what uh, rebasing looks like. And this is one that I've staged with the conflict. So let me get in here and share my screen. Right here. Uh, there's a file here that's called make them laugh dot text and we are joining this repository can you guys see this okay i'll zoom in really quickly i am um, this is what we it's just a console this is posh git if you don't use it um this is uh, uh just a command line tooling that's provided by github um it's an extension of powershell so uh powershell git so posh git um and it's just giving you a little bit of information here so it's telling me what branch i'm on and over here I have a file. And I'm gonna need you guys' help. We've got to finish this joke. <clears throat> Anyone? No one knows. I was hoping there's like someone with like a like a funny bone in their body here. Get, okay, get who? Knock knock, who's there? Get get who? Uh, get out of here. Okay. Uh, <laughs> like, <laughs> Whatever, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll ask for forgiveness. Okay, so um, I come over here, and of course, I know that I've got a change that's been made, so I can do git status. This tells me, hey, I've got this file that has changed. It's been modified. It's giving me some helpful information. I need to add it. So I type uh, git add, and I can actually give it the file name directly, but because I know there's only one change and I'm happy with everything, I'm just going to do git add dot. Um, so I stage that now. So the, it, I've told Git, when I, do, when I finally do a commit, I want you to include this as part of the commit. So I can leave things out if I, if I want to. I can do multiple commits and express multiple changes um, through a series of commits if I want to. But more than likely, um, or in this case anyways, I just want to add all of the changes because uh, I only have one. And I'm going to do a commit as well. So I'm going to start to move down this, and I'll just draw where we're at right here. So um, I knew that there was master, and I branched from there. And so I'm adding this commit now. I've made my changes, I've, I'm, and I'm going to move forward. So I do git commit dash m to put a message in. And man, I'm funny. OK, great. So I'm done. I go over to um, uh, master, so I'm just going to check out master. And uh, I will close this down and just reopen it really quickly. And you can see that when I uh, came over, somebody's already gone in and added a punchline and another joke. So knock knock, who's there? Get, get here. Get over here, baby. It's not good at all, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and there's another one. Did you hear the one about the sidewalk? It's all over town. OK, um, so somebody's been in here, and I realize that I've got some changes to make. So um, I want to make sure that uh, I'm getting that extra bug that's in there, or that extra feature that's in there, that new joke. So I'm going to uh, git checkout uh, punchline. 
Uh, Posh Git has tab completion, so I can start typing a branch name and hit tab and it'll finish it for me. So uh, Git check, check out punchline. And now here's where I wanna do the rebase, okay? So I'm going to uh, rebase master dash I. This is uh, kind of cool. This, so this, as, as uh, was pointed out, what we're saying is that I want to, wherever master is now, so after inspecting that, I could have had a look at the graph. There were actually two other commits over there. I want to say my root is now not here, it is here. So we have to replay these commits over where I live. I'm doing a dash I, that means interactive. It's going to give me an opportunity to um, express which commits I want. And if it runs into trouble, um, do you know what, actually I'll do this. Yeah, I'll do, I'll do it interactively. I'll say which commits I want to keep. And then um, if it runs into trouble, if there's a merge conflict, it's going to prompt me. So I'm, I'm pretty sure I know what's going to happen here, but we're going to, we'll learn together. So I say git rebase master dash I, and then it gives me all of the instructions. Uh, and in this case, it just says it's asking me which ones I want to keep or whatever. I only have the, the one commit, so I'm, I'm saying keep this commit. I'm not... Um, in an inter interactive rebase, I can actually say, hey, all of those commits that I made along the way, maybe, in this case I just made one, but maybe I made seven. All those commits that I made along the way, just squash them into one. And we're just gonna use that one instead. So this, this is giving me an option to declare that right now. So the first thing that comes up is this. And it's just that one commit that I made when I said, man, I'm funny, I'm, I'm picking it. And then there's a series of commands here. So the the tooling is actually, even though it's text-based and console-based, if you're using the, the console tools, it is, you know, it might, uh, for me it was intimidating when I was first getting into it, but it's also very explicit in trying to direct you on where to go and how, like where things are at. If it's telling you that there's files changed and you should add them or to the stage or whatever. So this is giving me an opportunity now to pick which commits that I want to keep and in which order. Okay, so I'm happy with this. I close this down and it's going to proceed. And it could not apply what I ran into because there's a, a conflict on that punchline. Somebody else had code there and it couldn't figure out what the difference was between them, which one trumped the other. So now it's saying you kind of got a problem state. I have to go back into my file and it's saying, well, this is where uh, master is right now. It's, the, it's head, so this is where the, um, the end of the, the graph is over there. It has this information in it and this is where you were. So there's this these arrow kind of notation here going on, and it's telling me what my commit was, that where this conflict was, and now I need to resolve this. Resolving this, you can use GUI tools. Um, if you keep your commit small, this is actually not a, a really hard thing to do just by opening up a text file. Um, an editor, I use VS Code, actually is my primary tool for resolution, which is like a 30 meg download, it's an open source project. Do you have anybody using VS Code? Few, it's, it's really, it's worth having a look at it. It has some really cool things like, um, open this directory. So, anyways, I'm not I'm not done with that. But um, so I know in order to fix this, I'm going to keep this joke here. That that one's a, a really legitimate joke. So I'm going to actually change that here. Get out of here. And I'll now this is the file that I want. So I have resol resolved this conflict. I now I now actually am expressing exactly what I want. So in cases where we, we might go in and have a function where somebody has written something and I've written something else, and we've got these two things, it's gonna come in, it's gonna show us, you know, this is what was there and this is what you have. And it's really smart about it. In this particular case, it wasn't able to, to determine, because there was nothing afterwards in the file, it wasn't able to determine um, where the, the root of the conflict was and where the problem was merging. But when you've got a file, like a C sharp file, we've got um, decorative elements of the language, of the syntax that kind of express, you know, this is the end of a function and here's, you know, there's white space things that are happening and, and whatnot. And gets really smart about... Is anybody interested in the theater? <laughs> um, so because it wasn't able to find something afterwards to kind of indicate where it was in the file, it had to just say, look, I can't figure this out. It just gave me a, a bunch of it. But in, in the case of like a, a C-sharp file, JavaScript, or any, like in your unit tests, whatever language you're in, it's actually pretty clever about figuring that out. So I resolved it. I said that my punchline was better. Um, I'm going to do that there. And now, actually, if I do, um, it's giving me some more information here. So when you have resolved this problem, run git rebase continue. So I just follow the instructions. 
Oh, sorry. And it's, now it's asking me for the, we have to do a merge commit. So we have to introduce where the, how we resolve the change. And so it's asking me for a comment here. So I can just close this file down. It's happy. I just left with the existing um, commit that I had, or the message that I had. It resolves it. And now I'm on punchline. And now I've got those changes. Now where I am in punchline is one commit ahead of where I was over on master. So, and if I close this file down and have a look at it, make them laugh has the changes resolved in the file. The repository is in a good state. I can do git status, and I'm clean. My directory is clean. No changes to me. OK, so that's um, rebasing in a nutshell. No. Um, I noticed there's only a couple hands rebasing. Um, I was like terrified of rebasing for a long time. And one of the ways that I actually got comfortable with it is I just started working on open source projects that required you to rebase. And that kind of makes you get into it pretty quickly. And because of uh, the fact that it's so easy to reset a repository in Git, like if you don't like where, you're ended, where you ended up, you just delete your local copy of it and you pull it back down. And if, if, you're, if you don't want to try fixing it from the command line or whatever, you can just start over. And it's really not that bad. So um, that's how I kind of gained. Uh, I, it's just the practice. It's the cadence of doing it. So that's what we're hoping to do here uh, tonight. OK, I've got one more really cool thing that I think is worth knowing because um, I only learned about this about a year ago, and I was like blown away that I did not know. Okay, so if I just continue going. There are more, um, sometimes we have to have a better um, idea um, about the changes, or we have to get in there and get really dirty. And it's not about the changes necessarily that are in conflict, but it's about changes that have caused problems. So if you think about um, uh, you're, you've got a website out there, you've been running along, things are going great, and then somebody says, hey, you know when I uh, click the add another one to my cart, it doesn't work anymore. Like it's just, I'm always stuck at one, and so I can't add like two, three, four to my cart. It just says one, when I click the up arrow, it doesn't change. And you're like, well, I know that that worked back in September, and then you have to try and figure out when was this bug introduced because we've got other branches. We want to make sure that this is reflected. We don't want any more code coming back in. We don't want a regression. We want to add a unit test and make sure that we're that we identify the bug. So um, this was this is what I this is what I would do today. I would write a unit test that exposes the bug, and that becomes a very important tool that you can use with Git. Okay, uh, test unit test tools. They exit with zero if nothing is wrong. So most of them, if there's, if there's a console runner, they exit with zero. If something is wrong, they come up with something else. And it depends on which unit framework, test unit framework you use, but anything that runs from the, the console from the command line, it just says everything's happy, returns a zero if there's been no problem. So now that I've got that tool in place, I can actually do something really interesting. I can use a tool called bisect in Git. And I can start walking the code base. And I can say, hey, I know back in September things were good. So I go and I identify in my repository where that's good. I can check it out. I can run that unit test against that version of the code. I see that it passes. I'm like, good. OK, I've got a commit that I can work on. <coughs> now, from wherever I was to where I am today, I can, tell, I can start working with this thing called bisect. I say, get bisect start. And then I say, where you are is bad. We're just right at the head right now of the repository. I just say, I'm in a bad spot right now. Here's my test that fails. I run my test, I get a one. So I say git bisect bad. But then I say, uh, git, I can then run bisect again, and it'll traverse. And this, sorry, this is, I'm walking through as though I don't know where the error is. It could have been anywhere in the history of the project right now. So it, it, what bisect does, does anybody, like the, the, it's kind of, it's binary, right? It cuts your commits in half, and it goes and it checks that one out. So I've got 3,000 commits on my project. I'm bad at the end. It goes to 1,500, and then after you run bisect, and then it'll then you say, oh, I, my test passed here. I'm good. So I type git bisect good, and then I do git bisect again. And then I go to the next point, and it says, well, I'm good here. I don't have to worry about that back half anymore. It goes to 2,250, and then it starts working from there. And every time I say good or bad, I run my test. I say good or bad, and I know. Eventually, um, I go through a whole series of those, and I know 
that I found the exact commit and it'll give me the information. It'll tell me explicitly, this is, this is the commit where the problem was. I can do this manually, but you can imagine like the repository that I'm on right now, I said nine people making multiple pull requests a day, several commits per pull request, two and a half years of history. I'm not gonna do a, a manual bisect. And we know that the way of the future for operating is more like we're gonna, we're gonna automate it, right? We're not gonna use the, the hand tools. So I say git bisect start and I say bad, because I know I'm in a bad state right now. Um, but I can give it a command to run, which is my test. And I can say, run this test, and every time it returns a zero, that's a good commit. And if it returns something else, it's bad. And then we type reset to get back to where we were. We've got the commit that's identified, and then we have the opportunity to go back, figure out where that code change, we know where that code change happened, we know that you know, this branch has been deployed to those servers and these people are, re are working off of that branch. We know how, at that point, everything that's gonna be affected by this regression. So I wanna show you how this works. Um, this is using uh, .NET tooling. So I am using, in this case, um, let me show you my, so here's my repository. I'll just spin this down. Uh, here we sit at the end of master. I'll back up one. There's a series of commits that have been happened. I'm not seeing anything that's particularly telling me where this defect might have started happening. Um, but I can see here that uh, there's, there's something interesting here, maybe this bug fixing one. But I know that when I was doing this one, for example, that I was, that's something, that I was in a good spot. So I can, I can go back you know, in time, like I've got dates, it tells me the dates when things were happening, and I can say, well, I, I know that it was, I don't wanna have to do this, I don't wanna have to go through each of these changes, I'm just changing one file here right now. When you've got a larger, larger code base, then it, it's a lot harder to, to hunt down. But from where I sit, um, I know that I need to identify where did this thing actually come into play. So I open up a command line. Uh, let me see here. So, awesome. Okay, so zoom in a little bit for us. Okay, so git uh, bisects start. And I say git bisect bad. So I, I know I'm at the end here of the head, so then I do my git. Uh, bisect good, and I give it a reference. So I'm going to go to, um, I have the hash of one that I knew was already good. So, where is it down there? Great. So I've got this hash. I just paste that in, and I tell it, this is a good one. And it actually, because it's a small code base, it knows that it can actually finish the bisect procedure in two more, it only needs two more operations. What's the best way of getting that, the hash? For the it's anywhere, in, any commit has a hash, so you can use any tool, you can use uh, git log to find the list. Yeah. Um, any visual tool that you've got has uh, every commit that's in the, in the repository. Any GUI tool that I've seen, you can right click on it and copy the SHA. So, that so be... it's, that's, that's like, as soon as you get into the tooling, you're gonna see it. That's in, that's in the GitHub desktop app it's as well? GitHub de desktop has it, uh, Source Tree has it. Okay. Um, there's another one that uh, they, they all have. I'll, yeah. show you, I'll show that in a second. Sure. So now I wanna run this automated tool. So I am, uh, I have a unit test that I've added. We'll call it a unit test, I'm kinda cheating. But I've got a unit test that I've added and I'm gonna run that unit test and it, when it fails, It'll know that it's bad when it's when it succeeds. It's gonna know it's good. So let me let me try this. So I'm gonna do git dnx, and I'm going to do source uh, git bisect testing, and I'm gonna zoom out a little bit here. Uh, no, not the proj. I need it to be the JSON, and I'm gonna call it git. This is the command. Um, so this is just me. This is just me invoking my tooling. So I'm invoking the the tooling that I need. Uh, this is the project configuration for uh, to, for me to execute DNX, and this is a, a command that I'm exporting from my project. This is the unit test. Oh, 
sorry, gets bisect. Oh no! That's a really cool demo when that works. Hang on a second. <laughs> Let me see if my notes tell me. Uh, get bisect. Oh, run. Sorry, sorry, sorry. There we go. Good thing for notes. It's, it's always scary when there's a bit of hiccups in the demo. Yeah, and actually, this is. It did tell me. It did tell me what I did wrong. Actually, um, uh, get bisect. It said here's the proper usage. Uh, start bad, good, new, old term, skip, next, reset, visualize, deploy, log, run. There it is. I just needed to read. So. Uh, not panic. Okay, so I add run in there, and then it's going to run that command for me, and then it was able to bisect some things, and then it figured out it's it's actually got this commit here uh, using local variable, and the commit SHA is right there, D617. Okay, so I do a git bisect reset. I flip back over to my repository which was here. And so I'll show you that those uh, hashes in a second. So it was D617. Okay, so now I'm just looking for right here. It's telling me the SHA is the first few letters. And actually it even said using local variable, right? D617, right there. Um, now hang on just a, a second. This is the one that it should have found, so that's that did not work. We'll uh, when we're hacking afterwards, you guys can come and we'll rework through that, and the demo will work first try. So uh, I'll do my Lego Batman first try. Okay. Anyways, so that's really handy. <laughs> Let me tell you. Um, no, that's a really powerful tool. We're gonna take a break now uh, for ten minutes, and when we come back, we're gonna start on some exercises to dive in and start cycling through. I'm going to figure out what I did wrong on that tooling change thing, um, and then I'll maybe uh, be able to demo that again afterwards. But 10 minute break. Lori, did you need to say anything right now? Yep, that's it. If you haven't gotten a red ticket, definitely come see me, and I'll give you one for draws at the end of the thing. Oops. Yeah, I don't know what that is. Just turn the keystroke water on, right? That's what happens. <laughs> okay, um, CLS, there. Go on. So I'm going to do uh, git bisect reset. Okay, so I'm back at master. So what do I need to do to bisect this guy? Get bisect start. Get bisect start. Get bisect bad. 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 I need to tell it. Bad. Got to emphasize the bad. If you use more A's, it works faster. <laughs> <laughs> so get bisect bad. Okay. And then? Get bisect good. Good, and I give it the SHA for the commit, right? So I'm not going to type that. We're just going to do this. Good, right there. So I knew that one was good. And now? Git bisect dash, what is it, run? Git bisect run, and then our command. Whatever's going to invoke yeah. our unit test framework. I just happen to be using DNX, DNX with dash a dash test export. Right. Your protocol. So, Whatever you had in your history there. Right, whatever's in my history. So git bisect run and then the command. So what I was missing was this dash dash project to tell it this is where the project.json lives. So dnx project, my path to my project.json, and then the command that I'm exporting in project.json. Anybody geek out, out over ASP.NET 5 yet? Couple. Awesome. Exporting commands is going to change the world. Okay, anyways, then it's going to run. Oh, and it's prompting me because this happens to be a console <coughs> app that prompts, and away we go. And then bang, finds the commit, tells me it's at the, the commit message with string interpolation. The SHA is 74A9. So I can pop back over, and then here it is, 74A9, return, and that's where the bug was introduced. There we go. What's that? Ta-da! I did do that the first time. The first time you guys clapped though, right? Ta-da! <laughs> okay, wonderful. Okay, so... I think the key thing there is you have to have testing framework in there to kind of make that magic happen. Um, yeah, I mean, typically you're going to have a, like any test framework that you have, like as I said, like you probably... Who's doing testing on the projects? Oh, sad face. <laughs> so the next session is going to be on unit testing. Um, 
we, okay, uh, we all have unit tests on our project, so there's going to be an automated runner that goes with it. So any unit's got a console runner, X unit has a console runner, whatever framework unit you, like in fact even, um, uh, does anybody use Postman for uh, testing APIs? Yeah, yeah awesome, great. Uh, Postman has a console runner that you can use to execute your tests as well in the paid version, but it's, it's a console app and it returns zero if um, nothing went wrong. So you've got your tests exposed to your framework, you tell the runner to go and it knows about your tests on your project and away it goes. So um, you can use something like um, uh, Saki, if, you've, if you're familiar with uh, PowerShell, that's what a lot of people use for build scripts. Um, you can just use like straight up PowerShell, you can use whatever you want. Uh, if you're using like AppVair and, and YML, you can do that too, um, whatever. And it's gonna execute your test for you. But in this particular case, um, I was just using, I was just exporting a command from a DX console app, so. Okay, so um, if we are at that portion of the evening where we are going to work through some exercises and you can move at whatever pace you want to. Lori, what time do we, what time do I have to leave? Um, well, I have to be there at, at like 10? I think I have, to, I have to be at the airport at 10, I think. I'll figure that part out. <laughs> um, so that means you should probably get out of here by 8.30. 8.30, okay, so for the next 45 minutes, we will run through the lab as quickly as possible. So if you go here, um, you will be able to start doing, there's a walkthrough. Um, to get on the Wi-Fi, you just have to um, abandon all regard for computer security and connect to the unsecured Wi-Fi network uh, called KPL Main. It's an open network. Um, and just go at your own pace. I'm not going to walk through. There's an introductory step. It gives you the commands. For those of you who are familiar with Git, um, this was something that I did uh, a few months ago and it was like um, walked through end to end and I was like, wow, there's like some like really cool things that are um, popping out that I wasn't uh, necessarily aware of, or I hadn't connected those dots, or I hadn't used it in that way, um, or a couple of things that I was doing actually where I, I went through and it said, hey, you did that in five, but our goal says you can do it in four. And then I'm like, I will not be beat by the script. <laughs> so then I would do it, like compress it down to three. You know, So there's, there's ways that you can get more efficient in using Git. And this is just a really good way where you're actually not working with source code, so it's non-destructive Git. So this is a very good little exercise to, to use. Um, my good friend uh, Scott is here. Wave, Scott. Yay. Um, Scott's going to help me proctor tonight. So if anybody is having trouble, um, you each get about 17 seconds of my time. And <laughs> we will. Um, but uh, Scott is here as well, and he will help answer any questions. Um, in about 25 minutes, I'm going to talk about the um, uh, the elephant in the room, I was asked, why didn't you talk about push and pull? So when we, I showed that slide earlier on, geez, I, like, you guys should tell me, like, dude, you have last slide. Okay, when I did this slide earlier on, this, this piece is enabled via push and pull, okay? So um, this stuff that happens in distributed source control, this is push and pull. It, we're in about 25 minutes, we're gonna jump on uh, to this repository that I created on GitHub, if you guys would like, and we're gonna just try and thrash it. So we're gonna do, you guys can fork it, you can pull down a copy of it, it's really lightweight, you can make some changes to the code, and uh, you're only gonna be able to do that if you've got Visual Studio, unfortunately, sorry, Apple people. Or you can just edit the text files like manually, and then we can just reject your pull request, and that would be cool too. <laughs> so we've got lots of options. So we're just gonna like party on those bits in about 20, 25 minutes. So uh, for now, do that, and uh, just ask if you got any questions. Mr. James Black, learn Git. Oh, sorry, uh, github.com, Mr. James, learn Git then um, you can fork this repository. So click that button, and then it's going to um, allow you to, so is anybody, okay, um, one of the things in the notes was to install GitHub Desktop. Did anybody do that? If you've done that, then, and you've set up your GitHub account, then come along with and do this if you want to with, with me. We're gonna do some, we'll fork it, and then we'll do some uh, like pull requests. So, like a Sesame Street, get, come with me, let's do GitHub. <laughs> yes, exactly, The le brought to you by the letter G. Um, so if you fork the repository um, 
and then uh, open up GitHub uh, desktop. I'll, I'll show you what we're going to do. I'll just give everybody a minute or two to... Uh, <clears throat> You know you got a problem when. <laughs> so, so I'm, <laughs> I'm building I'm building a filter for bad words. So. <laughs> so if you pull the if you from the client if you hit this plus symbol. You can go to your user, it probably will have prompted you, and then after you've forked it on the, um, on the website proper, it'll actually show up in this list and you can clone it from your repository. The other way to do it is if you've got it installed, again, uh, over here there is a, after you fork it, you can actually uh, uh, save this repository to a computer and use it in GitHub Desktop. So you can, you're free to do that as well. So just fork it first so that we can control the pull requests a little bit better. I push this button and or I've clicked the, I've done clicky clicky on the add clone and then picked my repository. So here it is um, under learn git. Uh, oh, I'm in some funky size thing, what's going on? There we go. Okay, so um, inside this project is a, a solution called Commits of Fury. <laughs> There are, I'll just give you a quick run through this project. There are five classes. Each class inherits from an interface called I am a class. It implements the method, the thing to say. And then in the program.cs, it basically news up the instances of each of those classes, for each is through them and dumps it to the console. So it looks something like this when we run. Hello, 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 hello. So this can do something more interesting. So. Um, each of these classes is up for grabs. I encourage you to do something like this. So I can do a, uh, for example, um, in, what am I in? I'm in class one. I can do some cool stuff. I can play with string interpolation in, in um, C sharp six. So I can say var James, e oops, James, Jarms, James equals James. And then I can do var the name equals, uh, James, and I've got string interpolation going for absolutely no reason whatsoever. And then we do it again here, and we say the name, great. Okay, now I've made that change. I can, so this is the same idea. Now I've, now my, when I do git status and I see the list of files that have changed, that's what this is. And it's using the, the console tooling, the command line tooling to figure that out. So I can do a git commit here. Um, checking or unchecking is what adds it to a stage. So if I had 12 files in here and I click this checkbox, it's going to select them all. It did a git add dot, and all of them were added. Yes. Okay, so do you uh, do a refresh on that, or did it just automatically just keep? It, it's, it's watching the directory. It's okay. watching the repository. So any any files in any directory is changed, and it's it's got a, a process that's watching that directory. So it picks up the changes automatically. And actually, I can prove that. I can open up a console. Um, so if I open up in git shell, which is just a right click, and then I'm in posh git, um, I can do uh, git add dot git commits uh, name change. Okay, and now you can see it just updated. I didn't do anything; it just changed automatically. So it's got my this is my graph that it's drawing. So it's not going down; it's going across. If I were to have created a branch, which I should have done, hang on a second. Uh, where did it go? Um, I will just really quickly create a branch. So this is the create a branch button. Oh, oh, come on. I have a mouse that's double clicking every time I touch it, so it's kind of frustrating. I gotta like, it's gonna be really awesome. Okay, uh, new branch name. So I might do feature slash um, uh, other things. 
So now I'm on this other thing which is different from master. Or actually, I, I, it's not different from master yet. There's no changes. If I click on where my, my kind of hover point is right now, there's no changes. But if I flip back over to commit some fury, I can go to another class, and then I'll say, uh, hello, everyone. And now I've got a change that's different, so more changes. I commit, so this is what's happening when I commit here. It's added another thing. It's telling me that I'm not synchronized with the server. From here, I can either publish this branch so other people can work on it. So this is the git push and pull bits that I neglected to, and I, I'm running out of time on. Um, but this takes care of that for me. This is pushing this branch out to the server. I've created this new branch called feature other things, and I can publish it. Or in one fell swoop, and this is where I would like to use tooling, is I can create a pull request, publish my branch, and ask someone to review my code. So I'm gonna do that now. I say pull request, it says what are you gonna call it? I'm just gonna leave it as more changes. And I'm gonna say please, and I do ship it. You guys know the ship it squirrel? Culture. Okay, um, usually when uh, someone reviews your pull request, if they approve what you've got, they give you a ship it squirrel, and then somebody else will do the merge for you. So a little bit of fun. It's really exciting when you get a squirrel in your email. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> Okay, so now if I'm looking, oh, I've already got pull requests, right on. So I've got pull requests, Mike is cool. Thank you, Mike. Um, so I'm gonna go in here, and here we've got this. Now I can look at the files that are changed, and it'll actually show me here that this is the only file that's changed. But if I didn't like that, um, I could have said, uh, this implementation doesn't support <coughs> localization. Please see Lori's upcoming session. Okay, I can, now I can feed back, we can interact, we can talk. Once that pull request is out there, here's like one of the coolest things ever, is I can go back into my, uh, my piece and I can say var uh, localized string equals, uh, sure, we'll just do this again, everyone. We'll pretend that's localized now, because that's what it is. And I'll use string interpolation again. <coughs> Hello, everyone. No, not even args. Uh, localized string, localized string, there we go. So now I, I pop back over to GitHub. I've, I've, I've made a change on this feature other things branch again. But I'm still on that branch. And my branch has been pushed and I've asked someone to merge that, that branch in. Because I'm on this branch and I've made another commit, or I'm about to make another commit, um, changes again. Please use more meaningful messages than that. When I create that commit and sync it, it's gonna push my new commit up to the, the server. And as long as it's synced, then I'm going to go back to the conversation. Scott Morris gave me a thumbs up right on. Um, so uh, it's actually not getting that commit. I apologize. I'm I, actually not sure what You that. didn't commit it on the client. Oh, thank you. There we go. Good eyes. There's a couple of cool yeah. things that this does. So this is going to push that commit up on that branch. <coughs> Next review. And in the conversation, it'll actually, uh, this isn't refreshing well, so there it is, that's what I wanted to see. Um, it actually says, some people commented on an outdated diff, so it actually says this is no longer relevant because the code's changed. And there's my second set of changes, and I have files changed in there, and now I've got the localized string. So this, the pull requests give us this opportunity for interactive feedback as we go. So if anybody wants to make pull requests on this, like I said, I'll watch it for a week. If you've got questions, um, please reach out to me. Where's my, uh, this one? There you go. Uh, that's me. Uh, I, as I said, we're doing the ASP.NET Monsters thing. You can follow us on Twitter, Dave and Simon, or the other ones.